the American farmer and rancher. And as we built a system, as we negotiated with the buying industry and finally was recognized after years and years of trying, we found ourselves empty-handed when the industry says, yes, we'll accept your production. We'll recognize you. We need your production here in our plant. We found ourselves having no means or direction to get it there. We were an organized body of people that had a small bit of recognition from the industry, but all of a sudden found ourselves empty in a method of which we can get our production from the farm to that industry. So we began to build a system out of necessity, and it grew. No one planned it. There wasn't any blueprints. It happened day after day, week after week, over the years. Until now, we have laid down a nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system right in the middle of the old procurement system of the old industry that's been there. We've established ourselves. It's there. We found that as the production moved through that system, it needed to have backup units to use the modern-day computerized equipment. We applied it to it. The organization grew. But during those growing days, we stepped on some big toes because you're not going to interfere with an old established system and begin to replace it with a system that is owned and controlled by the producers of food and fiber. When the buyers of food and fiber control their system for so many years without stepping on some big toes and taking some big blows. And we did. But we didn't bow down. When we faced the unformidable odds of the people that had the money and capital to attempt to, who attempted to destroy us, we defended our right because we believed in our cause. We knew it was right and it was just. We knew what our goals were and that if we failed, the free enterprise system would fail. We knew there was no other direction or nowhere else to go. So we defended our right against the powerful and established structures. We defended our right against the industry, against those that would destroy us financially, against the powerful government agencies. And we won. And when the dust of the 1960s and the 1970s settled, we're here, ladies and gentlemen. We're winners, established, respected, and we're recognized. It didn't happen without casualties. Through the battles, the frustration of the building, we lost many good people. We lost them because they got tired, they gave up, they perhaps believed we would never achieve the job that we set out to do. We lost many good leaders for various reasons. But let us never forget the reason that we are here today is because those people that stopped and died off or quit or on the wayside that aren't with us today or that gave up prematurely, it's because of their efforts. It's because of their determination when they were with us, along with ours, that we are here today. And I think it's time that we let them know it. The book for nationwide collective bargaining is written. The pages are written. We now know how to implement nationwide collective bargaining effectively for farmers and ranchers to secure a cost of production plus a reasonable profit. We've got the seasoned leaders at all levels. We have a new order of marketing and bargaining established. We can move production from our farms to 
processors who negotiate with this organization. We've got the people. We've got the production in our control. We've got the capital to finance every step of the way and to finance in such an amount that we can stand up against the powerfully established people and build a power block of strength to a point that no one dares to stand up to it. Because let's remember, you and I are all part of the largest, most powerful, influential industry in the world. And to combine that strength means that you have built a power block of strength that no other industry in this country or in the world can destroy if you put it together. The people, the production, and the capital that we control. It's ours to use as we please. We've accepted no money or grants from government, agencies, from the industry. We're financially free to maneuver as we must. We're not tied to any strings so that if we make a move, they say, stop what you're doing or we'll withdraw our finances. We're financially free, a free spirit in a world of high finance and high interest. We can take our industry and go in any direction we want with it. We're tied to no one except to ourselves. And that's important. We paid for every step we made, every gain we've made out of our own pocket. You know we did. That's why we're financially free today. There is no group, no co-op, no company, no corporation that's in the position that we're in, that controls the power in our hands that we have. It's ours, free to do as we please. And to top that off, having all of that, free to maneuver, having the largest industry in the world, part of it, the right to do everything that we have done and will do has been given to us by the Congress of this United States. What more can you ask of that? There is no nation in the free world or the bonded world that's been given that right, that much power as a people. So we have a responsibility. We've got a responsibility to use that right to benefit ourselves, our families, our communities, and our nation. Because this nation, in spite of the economic reports and the people who say it should not be, this nation depends on its agricultural commodities to receive a fair price out of the marketplace and to replace borrowed money with earned money that we can pay off debt and bring sanity back to our, back to our economic conditions. This makes you and I, and this convention, the most important gathering of people in this decade. There is no one else that has even a bit of a chance to reestablish economic stability to agriculture or to our national security. You and I, at this convention are the most important gathering of people if we want to make it so. You see, you and I aren't just farmers and ranchers. We're the leadership within the largest industry in the world, the most influential industry in the world that has the incentive the know-how and the ability to establish fair prices for the free enterprise system and to reestablish economic stability to that system. There is no one else. We're more than farmers and ranchers. We are the leadership. 
We're the leadership. It's going to be up to us to accept that leadership or to throw it off on the wayside and say, I'm not interested. My country isn't worth it. There is no one else. There's never been a time, there's never been a time since the early days of this organization when the conditions were so right to organize farmers and ranchers into this organization in collective bargaining. With prices skyrocketing, interest rates climbing, young farmers' impossibility to get into agriculture, we can give them hope. And hope is really all they have at this time. Conditions have never been so right to go out and talk to the people in the country, your neighbors and your community, to sit down and talk to them one-on-one -on -one because we've all got something in common. Low price, high cost, rising interest, and the inability to pass our land on to the next generation. We can offer hope because we have an answer. We can offer hope not only to the young farmers, we can offer hope to the processing industry that is stumbling because they demand and must have stable and uniform commodity through a system that no longer exists and the old marketing system. We can offer it to them. We can offer hope to the economics of this country because we can, from the marketplace, derive a fair price for the food and fiber that we produce, for the raw materials, to replace earned income with debt, debt with earned income, <coughs> pay off debt, cool off inflation, put our borrowed money back in the banks we borrowed it from for investment into new business and new industry, and keep old business and old industry going with earned profits. We can offer that hope, because we're the only people that can do it. We are the producers of the raw material of this country. We've got to stop selling eight dollars worth of raw material for 70 cents. It's destroying us, it's destroying this nation. We've got the means to stop it, and we have the leadership. It's you, you and I. We can offer hope to those that say imports will destroy us. We've got the plan to implement nationwide collective bargaining means to negotiate contracts with the industry to take our production first. Once they have our production, they will import what they need because they'll want to move that production that they bought. We can offer hope to those that say surpluses will destroy any means of getting a fair price. That membership agreement shows how we can take care of surpluses without any cost to the taxpayer, pay for it ourselves, develop methods to do it with. It's all there. We've got the constructive answers. But first of all, we've got to talk to people and point out to them what we do have. Because what people don't know, they don't know. And if we have the knowledge and the ability, it's not right and it's immoral if we are still within the community not to spread that knowledge and not to offer that leadership when there's people out there that need it. It's up to you and I. Industry is calling us daily for their needs because they know we are a supplier of food and fiber. They need a uniform supply and recognize that we can give it to them. The political arena recognizes us as a true representative, as an organization of true representatives of farmers, of producers of food and fiber, because we have represented ourselves in the marketplace. The representation that we have in Washington 
and in the political arena across this country have been bona fide, true food, food and fiber producers, farmers and ranchers. We've never hired it done. Our Washington representative that we have in Washington understands this. The best in Washington, as Devine pointed out. And he's recognized as such, respected, because he understands that he represents true farmers and ranchers. We're being asked to be represented on trade missions in the world. Your president has attended or went with two of them this past year. We're going to be asked to go on more. We've been asked to become involved in restructuring or structuring any future policies because of the input that we have that's constructive. These are things that came about because of the determination and the battles that we fought in the past that we won, the respect that we gained. And the reason for that respect is because we've never taken our eye off the goal of nationwide collective bargaining, the goal of achieving cost of production plus a reasonable profit by nailing down contracts with the industry through negotiations. That's number one. Never deviated from that goal. We're respected because we paid for every step that we ever took out of our own pocket. We begged from no one and we accepted no money from anyone. You're respected for that because nobody got a string attached to you. And I'm proud of that. And I know you are too. Tomorrow as you go into the commodity meetings, Keep in mind this, that 99% of our efforts in nationwide collective bargaining is getting into a position to bargain. It's not hard to negotiate a contract when you've got the production behind you. All you need to do is to pick up a telephone, in a lot of cases. 99% of bargaining is getting into a position to bargain. And to get into a position to bargain means that product must be put together out there in the country, on your farms, at your gate post, in your communities, in your counties. You know, I've been at the, spent a lot of time at the home office the past six months. And I wish that you could realize and recognize that where there is an effort put, to, put forth in a community or a part of this country, how that effort reflects on the people at the home office, those that are negotiating with the industry, those department directors who need to keep a department functioning, their morale soars, they're walking on cloud nine. When they come back from a meeting in your area, in your country, where the meeting was positive, forward, and plans were made to go out and get something done. It reflects on the people there that need to do the job of negotiating in a positive way. Everything that happens begins in the country, in your county, on your farm. To see the look on their face when they come in to exclaim the ability to be able to negotiate a contract with incentives because somebody out there put enough production together to make it happen. And when that happens over a large enough area, day after day, there will be no stopping this organization because the people that's doing the negotiating, their morale has got to be high like the morale in the country. You can drag their morale down by doing nothing. They're people. They're human. And they know that their hands are tied if no action happens in the country. 
That's why in these commodity meetings tomorrow, they're important. They're important because we have big plans with a vision. and reachable goals. And these goals that you will hear pronounced, keep them in mind. Apply them to your community as being part of those goals, as being part of the total plan. Because, friends, I'll tell you what, We are a nationwide team of leaders within the largest industry in the world. And as a team, by putting the production and carrying out the programs and plans and hopes and goals that will be set forth at this convention, there will be no stopping us. You can't stop a team that large with that much ability across this country once it goes into motion. We can now go out into our communities with pride, and we can hold our heads high, because we came through the darkest days of this organization, and we're alive. We're here. We're winners. And we can take that attitude and that atmosphere in the country with a smile on our face, and I'll tell you what, it'll rub off. And when it begins rubbing off, it's going to reflect on you, it's going to reflect on the total organization. And we're ready for it. It's been a long time of coming. I can understand your frustrations of the past because I was part of it, as frustrated as any one of you. From time to time, there were days when I thought that we weren't going to be here next week or even tomorrow. But it wasn't because only of miracles that kept us here. It was because of you. It was because of people with the determination and the will and desire to carry through. And with the help of God, we're here. And we are going to carry through. It's because of these frustrations of the past that we're here today. And it's because of the frustrations of the past that we know how to deal with tomorrow. All that's happened has happened for good reason. It's happened for good reason if we take advantage of it. But the hour is at hand. We can't wait until the next convention to try to get into a mood to do something in the following convention. Ladies and gentlemen, the hour is at hand right now. Our industry depends upon the National Farmers Organization because nationwide collective bargaining is our only hope for the family farm system. And the National Farmers Organization is the only hope for nationwide collective bargaining. And you and I are the only leaders within the National Farmers Organization with the know-how and knowledge to carry it out. There is no one else. That leaves us with a heavy weight in our shoulders when a nation is looking to an organization to save an industry that's been here for 200 years, the private, enter the private enterprise system in agriculture, the only private enterprise left in this country. Depending on what you do. And I'll tell you what, it's simple. The production that you and I control can go one of two ways. 
Either we're going to use the production on our farms to build nationwide collective bargaining and strengthen the ability to, to, to negotiate contracts by putting that production through the nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system. Or we're going to take the production we have and give it to the industry and the capitalized corporations to use to destroy what's left of the free enterprise system. And if they can't destroy it, to loan back the money and the profits they make and draw 16, 17, and 18 percent interest on profits they made from your and my production if we hand it to them. Think about it and tell your neighbor about it because we've got a system to stop that. It's in our hands. It's up to us. In the next couple of days, next couple of years, in fact, in the next couple of months, we're either going to expand our frontier rapidly as an organization, a nationwide collective bargaining, or the free enterprise system will be lost forever. I don't think there's a one of us that don't believe that because of the conditions we're living under. We've got a job to do, you and I. You see, our forefathers are no longer here. They can't do it. They're gone. The hour's at hand. Our children are yet too young or not yet born. So that leaves just you and me. We're here, we're now. We've got the ability, the know-how, the leadership, the structure, the system, it's all there. It's up to us. The free enterprise system depends on us. Let's not let them down. We're here, we're now. There is no one else. Next two days, I wish you good luck. God bless you. Get all the knowledge you can. Get the spirit, the fire, and get back home and put it together. Thank you. To introduce to the delegates here at our convention, Bob or Robert Partridge, representing the NRECA. Bob. President Devon Woodland, distinguished guests, officers and members of the board, and members of the National Farmers Organization. Actually, your president, Devon Woodland, and I weren't all that stupid. We sort of figured when we were at the White House that those little bowls with green leaves floating on them were probably for, uh, finger bowls. But the thing that really threw us was that they set them on a plate right in front of us, and that was the first thing that was in front of us. <laughs> and then uh, later came the food. So Devon and I fortunately did not try to put a soup spoon into those finger bowls. Only in the White House do they do things like that, Devon. I'm particularly pleased to have an opportunity to be here with you at your annual meeting. I have been here today. Well, of course, this is only one of many examples that might be cited of the way in which we and NRECA and NFO have worked together of, of uh, increased productivity and efficiency also as a tributal to the direct use of fossil fuels in the form of petroleum and natural gas. The development of today's energy, of today's energy intensive agricultural scene has resulted in a great 
and growing dependence on oil, on gas, on electricity, not just on the farm itself, <clears throat> but in every sector of our food and fiber system, including the production, the processing, the transportation, the marketing, and of course the final preparation, the packaging, uh, refrigeration, and so on, until it ultimately goes over the supermarket counter and into the home. According to a study uh, made some little time ago by the American Society of Agricultural Engineers, production agriculture takes about 3% of the total energy used in the United States annually. Our total food system, from the field to the consumer's table, however, uses about 16.5% of the nation's energy. Now that relatively small investment of energy into our agricultural uh, mechanism uh, makes it possible for one U.S. farmer uh, to produce enough food for about 56 other persons. Consumers have, have certainly reaped a tremendous benefit from this highly efficient uh, system in both an abundance of food uh, and in the price that they have to pay for food. The lowest price, relatively, uh, anywhere in the world compared to the average annual income that we have in the United States. Nowhere else in the world that we might look at can the majority of consumers purchase such a variety of high quality food for less than 20% of their disposable income and that's what we do here in the United States. The rich and the fertile land that we as a nation have been blessed with uh, has, of course, greatly contributed to the abundance. The know-how and the innovation of the American farmer has been mighty important, too. <clears throat> but it has been the availability of energy, energy for irrigation, energy for mechanized tillage, cultivation, harvesting, energy for production, and the application of modern fertilizers, weed control, uh, pest uh, control substances. These have been the key, the key factor and contributing to the abundance which we now enjoy in the United States. That's certainly no revelation to any of you. You're in the business. And as active working agriculturalists, you certainly have a first-hand knowledge of the role that energy plays in the day-to-day -day operation of your farms and your ranches. <clears throat> I'm sure that you know better than anyone else the kind of effect that a severe shortage of of uh, petroleum would mean for your tractors, for your combines, for the other equipment uh, on which you have to rely in order to produce your crops. You know better, I'm sure, than anyone else the effect that a severe shortage of fertilizer and other agricultural chemicals produced from oil and natural gas would have on the productivity of your land and your labor, the end result that it would have on your farm income. <clears throat> and I'm sure that you know better than anyone else uh, the kind of effect that a severe shortage of electric power would have on your ability to provide the vital irrigation water that has become such an important factor in improving both the amount and the dependability of your crop yields. And we are each year adding tremendously to the irrigated acreage here in the United States. And on top of all that, I'm sure that you know better than anyone else that the cost of energy in all of its forms has risen dramatically in recent years. And you are aware, very painfully aware, I expect, that unlike most other industries, farms simply cannot pass through that increased cost of energy to the next link in the marketing chain. The one aspect of American agriculture that has not changed much over the years is the fact that the price that you receive for your product is controlled primarily by such factors as weather, government policy, and a lot of other things. Now, I realize, Devon, that you and the NFO organization are making a real valiant effort to change a bit of that, and I wish you every success. It needs to be changed. When I lived on a farm, it seemed to me that we were perpetually in a situation in which we always 
went to buy at whatever price it was offered, and we always sold at whatever price they offered to give us. And that's not a very good way to do business, no matter where you may be. I think because agriculture does make great use of energy, agriculture in, in, in rural people in general, and agriculture in particular, farmers and ranchers, have been and will continue to be the hardest hit by runaway prices on all forms of energy. I doubt there are any of you here today who are unaware of the pervasive role of energy in modern agriculture and the devastating effect of skyrocketing energy prices on the economic viability of today's farmers. I only wish I could reach into my coat pocket and reveal to you an easy and foolproof prescription that would cure our energy ills. Unfortunately, I have had to conclude that, that there is no such miracle solution. There are, of course, many people speaking out in loud voices these days who would have us believe that there is a quick and easy solution to the energy crisis. Some say that solar energy is the one and only answer. Others point to the wind, and some point to geothermal heat locked in the Earth's core as our energy salvation. And still others contend that our nation's massive coal reserves can do the job single-handed, or that an all-out commitment to nuclear energy uh, would, uh, would solve the problem. A very vocal body of opinion uh, uh, states that simply eliminating the uses of energy, uh, which they portray as wasteful or frivolous, would eliminate any need for additional supplies. Basically, their theme goes that if we cut, cut back and tighten our belts, that uh, we can make it, we can do with the energy that we have got. Now, this crowd typically picks on the electric toothbrush uh, as a favorite whipping boy. Now, I don't happen to use an electric toothbrush, but I can guarantee you that if every American citizen used the electric toothbrush simultaneously, it would hardly cause a blip on the screen of the, of the uh, demand on energy in this country. So we have all of these people um, who are always, uh, with many voices, uh, putting forward the, with great assurance and unshakable conviction, the fact that theirs and theirs alone is the one true energy faith. And under these circumstances, it is a good question uh, whether the, how the average citizen, the farmer, the factory worker, the congressman, whoever it may be, how are they supposed to know what they ought to believe, to think, or to do about energy, even when the so-called energy experts find it impossible to arrive at any sort of consensus. I think we can hardly expect even our legislators to come up with the right answers on many of these questions. How can we expect to know what strategy, which technology, which energy philosophy, if you will, has the best chance of leading to adequate and reliable supplies of energy in future years when our top leaders in Washington can't really make up their mind on many of these things. Rural Electric Co-op members and many other people from across the nation have been asking me these and similar questions for quite some time. And I'll tell you what I have been telling them when they raise these questions. <clears throat> As I said, our global energy problem is of such a magnitude that we long ago passed the point of time at which we any longer had the luxury of picking and choosing from an energy smorgasbord uh, of conventional and of alternative energy resources. Steadily growing uh, energy demand worldwide and the equally inevitable decline in the availability of the finite uh, supplies of oil and natural gas clear, clearly indicate that our very survival will hinge on the development of each and every possible energy source in the years and the decades ahead. Our own nation's flexibility is even further constrained by our large and still growing reliance 
on foreign petroleum from increasingly unstable sources. I'm sure you've wondered, as I have, what this country would do if all of the oil exporting nations were tomorrow to cut off the pipeline and say no more oil. I guarantee you we would be in tough shape and it wouldn't take very long. Our, our own overall assessment and within the energy spectrum that we work in of the energy supply situation for both the short and the medium term, medium term period, in other words, from now until the year 2000, is not at all optimistic. We believe that our only hope <clears throat> for providing for energy and, and or conversely of avoiding a very significant energy famine and the severe economic and social dislocations that it would bring, uh, the only hope for avoiding that will be for us to pursue all possible avenues leading uh, to the development of all kinds of energy resources, every single energy option open to us. There are, we believe, a number of actions that must be taken at once without any further delay. We must, we believe, first of all, find a way to mine, to move, and to burn much greater amounts of coal in a safe, economic, and environmentally responsible manner. We have the coal in this country, as you know, plenty of it, estimates ranging from 300 to seven or 800 years supply of coal uh, already uh, discovered and no telling how much more in the way of reserves not yet uncovered. So we've got it. The question is whether we can find a way to use it. Achieving a goal of using greater amounts of our own domestic coal is going to take a tremendous investment in capital and other resources, and it will require particularly and importantly, that our government reassess some of its priorities and policies in the regulatory and the environmental areas. In a second area, it seems to us that we must pursue, again, without delay. We must make the greatest possible use of the energy of the atom. The safety record of the U.S. Uh, nuclear power industry is unparalleled in modern times, and it's my own sincere belief that the lessons learned and the increasing concern for safety resulting from the Three Mile Island accident back last April will make the next generation of nuclear power stations even safer than their predecessors. Now, I think you probably know, as I do, that there has not been one single fatality in a commercially operated nuclear power plant in the United States, not one. No other industry can possibly nor does it even attempt to match that safety record. And yet here we are today at a time when we're literally being strangled to death on energy in the United States, re refusing to proceed with the development of nuclear power plants, refusing to license them for construction, refusing to uh, put out the license for their operation. Talk about Harry Carey, this country is well on the way to doing it. We have long advocated the continued development of the advanced breeder uh, reactor technology and the reprocessing of nuclear fuel. This is one way we can stretch our domestic uranium ore by a factor of about 70 and well on into the end of the next century at least. If we go with the light water reactors that we're presently using in this country, we'll soon use up all of our domestic uranium ore and we'll then be in the same unhappy situation on uranium that we're in with respect to oil. That is, most of it will have to come in from abroad, from very uncertain sources at very high prices. Again, not a good situation to be in. I noted, as you probably did in the press just recently, a report issued by an international commission which has been at work for two years studying the nuclear fuel cycle. That study makes it crystal clear that the United States is alone among the industrial nations in this world in its determination to forego the use of the breeder and of fuel reprocessing. Every other major nation has concluded, as I'm sure we eventually will, dragging our feet as long as we can, just as we now are, but we too will someday have to conclude that the increase 
in the efficiency and the fuel supply dependability from these advanced technologies uh, far outshadow uh, the real, any, any realistic assessment of the risks from nuclear power. Could you say to you that as a great national farm organization, I wish you every success. I hope that you'll do all of the things in 1980 as we all start the new decade that you set out to do and on your organization <coughs> I'd bet some money that you'll get most of them done Devon, and I hope I'll be there uh, to share some of the victories with you. It's a pleasure to be with you, a pleasure to work with you and your leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you.